Greetings and salutations and welcome to another episode of Linux Lads. Um, as you can tell, I am not Shane, <laughs> I am Connor. Shane is uh, off gallivanting somewhere on his holidays. So um, one time we had uh, Mike off in Spain or, or somewhere in Eastern Europe or something. Uh, well, now Shane is off gallivanting off somewhere. We don't even know where he is. He's probably sipping a, a margarita on a Jamaican beach or something. <laughs> um, and of course, we're also uh, um, joined by... Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hi, people. I'm also not Shane. <laughs> okay, so uh, I suppose we'll get into this. So um, as we kind of mentioned on our on our socials and everything, um, this one is a bit delayed. So sorry about that. Uh, we had um, kind of a few things going on last weekend, so we couldn't record last weekend. Um, and also this is our last episode before we take our, our bit of our summer break. So we will be, um, taking a break of roughly, um, about a month. So two episodes and we'll be back in some time in September, which is about as specific as we're going to be for the moment. Um, and this one is just going to be loosey goosey, uh, no, no real structure to it. We'll get through a bit of news. We'll get do a bit of discussions, um, some feedback that people have provided on Twitter and so on. We have a coupon code for thirty percent off when you pay for three months of Azure VPN. They are security focused VPN provider based in Sweden, where the law does not uh, require them to log traffic. They operate servers in Europe and North America. Their servers are owned not rented and installed on location by their engineers and r are running Debian Linux. They provide WireGuard and OpenVPN options. Their client is uh, GPL v2 licensed and uh, is available on Linux. They take all major payments, including cryptocurrencies, and they don't even require you to uh, give them an email address. So if you use the code Linux lads when you're ordering, Make sure you click the add the green add code button to get the discount, and the discount is valid until the first of January twenty twenty. So now we have a bit of news that we'll be getting through. Um, Mike, you added this one in. Is Facebook got slapped with a five billion dollar fine? Yeah, so Facebook uh, is uh, being fired by the American uh, Federal Trade Commission, if I'm uh, reading the, uh, the abbreviation properly. Uh, it's for their everlasting efforts to uh, get our data to the farthest corners of the universe with everybody and their dog have access to them. So, uh, you know, everybody remembers the Cambridge Analytica case and there's been others where Facebook just sold people's data like it's going out of style. And uh, they kind of agreed on settlement, which is $5 billion. It's a lot of money from almost everyone's perspective, but only just about a month's worth of revenue for Facebook. And it's the biggest fine FTC has ever dealt to anybody. Uh, this, this is... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Just meh. I mean, I don't know what you would have to do at this point to actually make them uh, make them feel it because five billion dollars. I don't know if it even means anything to them. If they just look behind the sofa, find a change, and give it to the FCC or something. Uh, oh, it's, it's it's just the whole thing of it. Just boggles the mind that there's a company that it's five billion dollars is a month's worth of revenue for them and that is effectively um it's a slight great uh, step up from a slap on the wrist for them i mean if they if it was like uh 600 million or something like that facebook would be like oh whatever um so it's a it's a slight step up above that but they're not exactly really kind of feeling it if it's if it's a, a lyric they'll just write it off and go okay uh, that was a bad month uh, revenue wise next month will probably be better it's literally all it's going to be is just going to be a note at the end of it um it's it's just boggles the mind that their a company could be that large where five billion just means nothing to them 
also it's an amazing statement on how much our data is actually worth because five they, they make five billion dollars in a month and they don't like they don't create anything it's all just people's data and advertising like how that, that that's a massive amount of of money that they make and on the other hand it's nothing to them i don't know it's just my mind is boggled officially i just can't even comprehend this i think yeah i, I often talk here about how these companies need to be broken down and uh, how the the concerns need to be separated between people who who between platforms and uh, content creation and advertising this is just for me this is just an example and i don't know i don't know what else to say it's 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 like bordering on the ridiculous uh i i will it attempts to make a, a bit of a positive spin on not not necessarily this specific article but just uh facebook being the behemoth that it is is uh f there is a, i think there's a facebook open source um team inside facebook and they have a twitter account and they have um, their own website and apparently that team do actually do um write some quite compelling projects and everything like that so there's uh, apparently it's it's actually so it's i'm not yeah i, I mike is shaking his head there in the background but uh, yeah but it's uh, it is a kind of a positive spin like there is a massive behemoth but at least there's some kind of agile little team inside it that is actually doing some good oh, that's what i'm saying i'm not i'm not saying look uh as Jono bacon keeps saying on bad voltage there is plenty of or there are many very good and nice people working for facebook and i don't disagree like it's a, such a big company that it did i don't for a second believe that it's just like the uh, I don't know. That is the consulate of of hell on on the, the air for devil and, yeah, devil and Yeah, I, I I don't know. You know, I, I I don't know anybody personally who works there, but I'm sure it's it's nice people, and they do produce some really neat stuff like uh, React, that is the uh, probably the most popular uh, JavaScript framework for making interfaces and stuff. That's that's made by them and made freely available for everybody, and uh, I. Don't, I think there's been some controversy about it about a year ago, but they since like they release it under open source license and it's it's there for everyone to use and everybody uses it and it's great. You know, the same with Google. They do ton of great stuff. Microsoft the same thing, you know, everybody everybody does a lot of good stuff. But unfortunately the bulk of their business is taking your data and selling it and making it like piles upon piles in the process. So yeah, uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's all I can say about it. It's it's mind boggling. Um, uh, anyone is free feel to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I actually I thought they um they're one of the larger organizations running um uh, ButterFS as on their on their servers or something like that. They may uh, that might be old news, and they may have switched off from that, switched away from that, but um. I thought that um, um, they were one of the larger people using rolling out or deploying ButterFS. Yeah, I think that was, uh, if I remember correctly, there was a bit of a, a bad spin on ButterFS on that one as well because ButterFS has got, uh, as, as file systems go, it has got a reputation for being unstable, some would say even unfinished. And uh, when people started pointing out, like, it's production ready, look, Facebook using it, are using it. But and some other people say, yeah, the way they use it, they are using it all in RAM, in memory. So there is no persistence needed for it. So if it crashes, well, it crashes, they reboot it. So I don't exactly, obviously, I don't know how they use it. Um, and uh, but yeah, they 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 built upon uh, they built upon uh, open source infrastructure. They enrich the uh, uh, you know they enrich the uh, the ecosystem. They help out a lot of uh, a lot of people with new technology, even the proprietary stuff that they keep inventing. Like uh, you know, WhatsApp is terrible and everything, but it does even Facebook. You know, it's it's horrible and everything, and it, but it does connect communities. You know, it does it does give connection to people who would wouldn't otherwise be able to talk to each other. It's just it has a dark side. And the dark side has to be, you know, the, the, the dark side has to be investigated 
and uh, regulate it. And uh, it, if, if there is something really bad going on, that has to be stopped. Uh, I, I, and that's it, really. <laughs> I was, I was just smirking while you're when you're um, uh, because it popped into my head while you're while you're making that discussion was um, <laughs> just I don't know maybe it's just the wording that you're using but I was like are, are uh, Facebook the new people are doing the triple E <laughs> 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 I, 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 I doubt that that's true but it's just I was, that's the reason why I was kind of obviously the audio listeners were, would not be privy to it but I was kind of smirking in the background while, while, while Mike was talking there just that uh, just that uh, people f- no, who don't know what do you mean by triple E it's not like free pills of ecstasy it's more like uh, <laughs> it's uh, what Microsoft used to be used to be used to yeah, have was, um, ex- yeah. ex- expand embrace extinguish exactly so it's a business strategy where you take in what your competitor does and uh, expand upon it with proprietary measures and then throw it away. I don't know if Facebook are exactly doing that. They uh, they don't seem to be uh, monetizing software like uh, they are they are monetizing your data. So it's a kind of a different business, but uh, and they do other nefarious stuff as 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 proven by the FTC uh, ruling or settlement or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, hey, well, it's Facebook. Eh? I- uh, I think I, my um, take on on Tripoli or expand embrace extinguish. I think was the whole idea was um, like Microsoft in the in the nineties were doing it. Um, was that uh, there would be a pre pre existing product and then Microsoft would expand upon that product, um, saying, "Oh, uh, so you're already running this, but what we're doing is we add um, a couple of extra features." And then Microsoft, because they're such a big um, developer powerhouse, these their expand their added on features would be quite well made, and then they just kept iterating on their or on their thing and then their the whole thing is they're saying well uh, our our add-ons have begun so essential that the in- industry effectively moves to have the the core product plus their their um expansion their expanded on add-ons as the standard and then microsoft was, uh, effectively the, the the industry just shifts towards just using the microsoft add-ons exclusively and then the original product just whittles and dies dies away is essentially what the whole triple e strategy was yeah it it comes from the gates balmer era of microsoft and uh, or eras and uh they did it to novel famously i think or something but that's ancient history i was very little when that happened and uh, people won't let them forget it, especially on places <laughs> like Reddit, uh, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, and and thankfully, the uh, with uh, GPL code, it, they effectively, it's impossible for G- them to do that. I'm not saying that that is their strategy currently. Uh, it's, uh, they're very much saying that they, Microsoft are a changed company. I'm not saying that that is Anyway, their current policy, but even if it was their current policy, it would be effectively impossible for them for them to do that because it's like GPL code. We can just fork it. Are you talking about the uh, you know the way they've been included on some uh, on the distros mailing list recently, and the way they are now uh, using basically the Linux kernel and the Windows subsystem for Linux too, uh, or something? Uh- uh, no, no, just in, in general, I wasn't talking about anything in uh, specifically. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think it's a specific team within Spark, within Microsoft is has been added onto that, and there there has been debates um about whether the if if the the addition onto that security council or whatever should just be called Microsoft or should be called whatever's internal team within Microsoft is is the people responsible and uh, it's, it's not the case of Microsoft are just suddenly saying we demand to be on this as in it's one or two guys who have shown that they're legit part part of the community and they've been contributing a shit ton of code and everything so the people are uh, the security t- team were like okay yeah that's fair enough like they they if they apply to be on the console then they they have a track record of being very good and th- those those couple of guys, they deserve to be on the council. It's not Microsoft themselves. It's not like it's going to be some um, senior um, exec from Microsoft who's going to be sitting on that security council. It's a couple of Microsoft employees who've, who've shown their track record of being very good. So 
the debate was whether it should just be called uh, these one or two guys from Microsoft or with these couple of guys from whatever security team within Microsoft. So it's it's it. There is a, a whole lot of a per, hyperbole with with um, uh, news headlines around that of Microsoft is joining this security team. No, it's, it's a couple of guys who happen to be Microsoft employees who have shown the track record of being very good within the the, the Linux security community and um li- like because they've applied to us and then the the guys are like okay yeah you li- legit deserve to be on that because you've contributed the vast amount of code or whatever or have you been an active member of of on the um in the security ecosystem anyway um moving on <laughs> the next uh, headline uh, it was another one added by mike and this is actually very good news and i kind of wish the chain was here to discuss this as well because um he's a a big advocate of this piece of software so ubisoft and epic um have tr- thrown their financial support towards blender so they're yeah it's uh two pieces of good news for blender in uh was it one week or 10 days so epic games the creators of unreal tournament and fortnite if i'm not uh, or and PUBG, if i'm not uh mistaken right um i i i don't use the i haven't played those games so you know you um, wouldn't your because guess, are, the, the, none your of guess their, is yeah none of their stuff as far as i know is available for linux <laughs> uh <laughs> But uh, so so they basically uh, awarded Blender one point two million dollars from their Mega Grants program, uh, and uh, I do, I think they are gonna like uh, give it to them over a course of some years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a trickle. It's not the case of here's a check for one point two million and then. Like half at it, you could spend it all at once if you want. But it's the, it the kind of thing; it's going to be going through in, in bits and pieces over over a set set period of time. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's one thing. And then Ubisoft, uh, another another game and animation studio, uh, they gave they become a corporate gold member, which I think is to the tune of thirty grand a year uh, of the Blender Foundation's development fund. So. Uh, and uh, they will start using Blender as their main digital content creation tool, uh, which is basically so it's a lot of money, and it's also acknowledgement of how just has how bloody good and professional great uh, Blender is. I mean, for me, I open it, I panic, and once I overcome the heart attack, I close it and start uh, using something else. But uh, like for pro- this is obviously an endorsement on the highest level. They these companies see. A, how great Blender is, and also how helpful it is to have an uh, open source project that's available for everybody. I'm pretty sure that this is, uh, they must have done some evaluations and they must have done some cost analysis. And if they are throwing this money at it, that means that they reckon it's cheaper for them and more valuable to support an open source project than having something like this developed in house or buy it from a third party. So, this is just not only endorsement of Blender, but this is endorsement of open source. And uh, yeah, absolutely positive news. Uh, without a without a doubt, and it's it's um, showing serious. Um as you were saying, it's showing serious credence towards um, Blender as a tool. If the very fact that they're saying, "Yep, this is this is professional grade," in other words, this is up with, I I do not know the treaty, uh, the rival treaty modeling software. So um, this is up with your proprietary treaty modeling software of a nameless one that I, I would not be able to name because I'm not familiar with it. I mean, Maya, for but, example, or, or yeah. Um, it's a recognition that Blender is up to that quality and at at least matching that quality. And they they probably noticed that a lot of their their artists are is, are probably using Blender anyway, and they're just thinking, okay, well, if they're if the, if if our staff are using it, there's no better acknowledgement of its quality than our staff are using it in their day to day job. So then it was probably. Uh, they could have been doing this for years and using it for free. Um, no doubt that they probably have been using this for for years free within the organization, and then 
then the cost analysis just came up and said, listen, guys, there is this tool that that our organization is relying upon and they, they might even have uh, internal constraints or internal things of saying, okay, Blender's a really good tool, but we kind of wish that it did X. Well, if, the, if you want to provide that feedback to to the the developers who make Blender, then pony up for it. In other words, if if you want the development hours to implement X, which is the the, the feature that you want to add in to to Blender, then for, throw money at throw throw money or for development time in order to implement X. So, if they're doing this on an annual basis, that means that they effectively have have their influence on the development of Blender. So for the for example, Ubisoft with their thirty grand a year, they're saying, Okay, we're contributing thirty grand a year and we're using this tool, but if anything comes up um within our organization of Blender is a really good tool, but we wish that it did something, then they they essentially have a hotline to say Hey, we're we're kind of con- we we've paid for a developer at the thir- thirty grand a year. We've paid for a developer or the vast majority of his salary or whatever like that. It's like it's fine that uh, uh, during his day to day job he's he's just working on Blender in general. But could we get him to implement X for our organization since we're effectively paying his salary? Um, so that kind of influences is, is is where I can see it. Yeah, I I agree, and it's good that it's not just one organization. So no one organization will have complete control, and uh, because it's still a community community project, it still is uh, it still is uh, protected from that way as well. So yeah, I uh, basically I just yeah. I, I can't see anything negative about this. Oh no, it certainly certainly is. This is all positive. Um, yeah, ultimately it's the Blender Foundation's. Um, uh, decision what direction Blender goes in, but though is those peripheral cases where we're talking about where uh, Ubisoft are saying, okay, we're we're employing, I don't know, globally one thousand um three D artists. I, I I'm just making up a figure. Um, and so we're a, a very heavy user of Blender, and of and also it's it's a benefit of Blender as well because then that the code effectively gets battle hardened because it's the, if there's 1000 or 5000 uh, developers globally who are relying upon it then all the little uh, stability bugs and all that all will get reported up and they will all get um they'll all get ironed out a lot quicker than if it was just uh if they didn't have that amount of information to tap Essentially, if they're just saying, "Okay, we are vaguely aware that that organizations around the world are using our product," but if they say, "Okay, we know that Ubisoft have five thousand again," I'm just making up a figure: five thousand employees or five thousand developers are, uh, across the world who are using our tool day in, day out, and that means that if Ubisoft have raised raised something saying, "Yeah, when you click on this." We're expecting this to happen, and it doesn't happen, and or or something along those lines. Then, then that gets solved pretty quickly because uh, Ubisoft are providing financial uh, support for that as well. And the same thing will go with with from Epic Games. You can exact same scenario, but copy and paste it over to Epic Games, where Epic Games is saying, "Okay, we're using this tool, and they might be using it in an entirely different way, but." And that is even better if they're using the tool in an entirely different way than Ubisoft or any other development house are using the tool because that means the Blender gets stressed stressed in another direction. And this can only be good for the development of uh, free and open soft, source software. Yep, absolutely. I agree. Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, this one we will men- I'll mention very briefly. But uh, KD Connect is now been ported over to Windows 10. So all you people over in Windows 10, it's like uh, giving people a, a glass of water when they're in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thoughts, Mike, very briefly. 
Uh, no, I, I mean, to, <laughs> I, yeah, it's good. It's good that we can spread Linux, Linux goodness to uh, other operating systems and uh, tell other people what they are missing. I know. Uh, I think it's already been ported to the Mac platform uh, yeah, look, because easy, yeah. uh, I don't think Mac has an, has had anything like this. Maybe for the iPhone, but not for Android. Uh, so now you can uh, you can connect your Android device uh, to your uh, Windows, or maybe it's being ported. So maybe in the future soon you should be able to uh, use KD Connect with your uh, Windows computer. Uh, yeah, I mean it would. They I I don't know if they are adding this feature, but maybe uh, if they. The, Add in something that would uninstall Candy Crush uh, once uh, on new Windows uh, Windows 10 installs. That might be helpful as well. And other ways of getting rid of uh, making making Windows a bit more useful. But I don't know if they are built in that kind of a feature. And it seems to be that it was a result of Google Summer of Code. So that is a way that Google is positively contributing to the open source movement. The next one is how to mirror and control your Android phone from your Ubuntu uh, desktop. Tangentially related, because I think um, with KDE Connect, you can do sort of-ish the same things. But this would actually show the preview of your of your screen up on, on, your, on your Ubuntu desktop. So you would actually see what your phone is actually doing. Uh, it's S-C-R-C-P-Y. Uh, which I guess is a truncated form of screen copy. Uh, I'm just going to call it, going to call it Scrippy uh, because it's, <laughs> it's easier to pronounce. Um, it's coming from, uh, OMG Ubuntu. Um, and so if you want to see the, the visual representation of somebody's Android phone appearing on their Ubuntu desktop, then, uh, click on the link in the show notes. Um, uh, Mike, any thoughts on this? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I think the SCRCPY uh, thing was done by somebody who knows the uh, STRCPY or string copy. Uh, is it uh, built in from the C language? Uh, it's it's a kind of a very nerdy joke. Other than that, I can see how it can be useful for people. Probably not for me, but uh, yeah, more functionality and more choice is always good. Alrighty. Very good news. The a new Pine Brook Pro video demo demos 4K video, external monitor support, and WebGL. Uh, I think they had, they're um, getting Quake Three running on the Pine Brook Pro thanks to uh, the video is thanks to Lucas and the uh, the article that we're linking is from OMG Ubuntu, and in the article it says the. Uh, the orders are live as of the 25th, but as of this recording, we're past the 25th. So we'll say that the pre-orders are now live as of the 25th. Um, so that's very, very good. Yeah, so these are the pre-orders for the Pinebook Pro. I think uh, there is uh, the members of the forum or people who were men members of the forum, of the Pine64 forum on July the 1st are... Uh, in priority for that and uh, they have got some hardware upgrade for free there as well i think storage wise uh, the I, I think yeah i think they're going to from from uh their hard drive is going from 64 to 128 or or maybe 32 to 64 i'm not sure yeah something like that for the EMS, emmc storage uh so We've talked about the Pinebook Pro uh, uh, for a long time um, on this uh, on this podcast and uh, about all the other stuff that Pine64 do. Uh, I will admit that I'm a big fan of theirs because, uh, you know, they, uh, they release Linux hardware uh, for the hobbyists and with the Pinebook Pro, they are now reaching out to, like, people who just need a daily driver computer. And uh, they, you know, I like their style where they just, uh, you know, here are our products. Uh, this is what they are meant for. And uh, they, it's not, it's it's uh, basically, I, I like I like that, that company. And I also like their pricing. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the Pinebook Pro is uh, going to be, I mean, I, I hope it's going to be as good as I think it's going to be. So, 
And uh, yeah, uh, when you're talking about the the price point, um, two hundred dollars full retail price for this, which is is amazing. And and as the demos, uh, click on the article to see the demonstrations. But you are seeing four K videos. Uh, hook, uh, as I said, hooking up to an external monitor, so you can you could use this as your as your portable work device, and then go into your laptop and then hook it up to an external monitor. Um, obviously, it is running ARM, but two things that brings down the cost. What, the reason why they're able to to, to uh, target two hundred dollars for a, a fourteen inch laptop, and also great for battery life as well. Um, there there might be an issue about um, not every application has been cross compiled for the ARM architecture, but um, I would imagine that. As more ARM devices are getting out there, that will gradually be solved. Uh, and another potential solution for that is just install Arch and then get everything from the AUR and probably the AUR might cross-compile it, I don't know. It's always a solution to install Arch. Uh, although I've, I have some um, experience with the AUR on the Pine Book, on the original, or on the 10, 1080p yeah. Pine Book, and uh, it doesn't always work mostly basically i think it would work in many cases if you were able to uh you know mess around with it but i'm not that technical so i don't go inside the package scripts and i don't uh, change the compiler flags and stuff like that because that would that would be more work for me than what the software is well than than the need for the software but uh if you for for the for the uh, yeah, for me, it'll be, that'll be, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for the desired purpose, so for w- what they are, w- what they say, this is meant to be like the competitor to the Chromebooks, uh, which already, you know, are on the market. So Chromebooks are f- made for people who browse, maybe some uh, lightish uh, content creation, studying uh, lightweight computers with ton of memory life, uh, ton of memory life uh, I don't know. Bat- battery life battery life yeah uh, ton of battery life and uh, really uh, really great price point and i think from what we've seen this is going to be exactly that it's for people who uh, like to like to carry carry their computer around i like to have it available all the time uh, people who want to do it on a budget and people who want to browse the web people who want to uh write research um even coding i can imagine is going to be working because you can install a vim obviously so uh that's uh that's one thing i will would say is it's a similar price point to a chromebook and it'll be similar dimensions to a, a chromebook i mean this is a 14 inch laptop this is way more powerful in terms of of uh hard both hardware and well uh, the, at the price point i'm talking about obviously there's really expensive chromebooks um at the price point that I'm, we're talking about it's way more powerful than your than the com- competing um chromebooks for the same price and also way more powerful in terms of freedom as in the Chromebook is severely locked down. You can't uh, now they've they've kind of retroactively said, "Oh, you can install Linux apps like GIMP and things like that and everything." But all of that is just kind of tacked on layer afterthought. This will run uh, everything natively. You are running Linux, and not only that is in the traditional Linux uh, open source uh, um, sense. It will come with a distribution. You don't have to stick to that distribution if you do. If you don't want to, you can install your Manjaro. You can install. Uh, there will be other images available at launch, and this has been, um, this has been working, been working in the background. And um, I, I've uh, asked Lucas directly, and he's confirmed it that there, you don't have to stick to whatever the Pinebrook comes with. Uh, the Pinebook Pro comes with if you do not want to. Um, what it will come with is Debian with a Mate de- uh, desktop, which is will be a very good, very solid uh, distribution of Linux, and it will be it's specific for that, so it will be optimized. But there will also be Manjaro. There will also be uh, other um, 
uh, Linux distributions, the, the names escape me at the moment, but there will be about two or three other options. I'm sure, that, I'm sure there will be, uh, um, Ubuntu will be, will probably will be event, available eventually. I did not know, but there, it's certainly at, at launch, I say there will be probably be a, three or four options that you can install on, on this if you do not wish to stick with what it, what it comes with default. Um, and I mean, this is really exciting for me because the, the build quality, the build, the build quality of the original, uh, it was is plastic, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's it's durable. This will be all metal, which is really really exciting for two hundred dollars. This is a metal laptop with a decent um keyboard. Is what I heard early reports. So obviously, I'll have to wait until I get my hands on one, but decent keyboard good solid build quality for great battery life i mean at the moment i'm looking at my thinkpad t450 and i'm thinking am i going to be using two laptops <laughs> <laughs> because if i if i and i will be getting one uh, one of these pine books uh without a doubt because it's such a, it's so cheap and it's su- such a cool device to be able to check out and I, I now have to have a serious debate in my head of whether i I keep my T450, even though that has a, a four, uh, like as a Core i5 and like eight gigs of RAM and like a very decent, powerful laptop with a 500 gig SSD in it. Very decent, comp- uh, powerful laptop. But am I going to be running with two laptops? <laughs> so I have to have a serious debate in my head once I, once I get the, this Primebook Pro. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's uh, definitely coming. Okay, um, next bit of news, uh, very briefly, only Office um, has come up with a, a new uh, version, seems to be uh, quite an, a lot of new features, which is good, and also it's a it's a, uh, an open source Office suite uh, that's cross-platform Windows, Mac and Linux, so it's always good to have competition um even though we heart Lib- LibreOffice on this podcast it's always good to have competition so good on you uh, only office for being another uh, open source office suite that's cross platform out there uh, more powerful power to you i've tried to use it uh, before it has got some nice points like the ui is minimal and clean and uh, it's uh, it's quite good for it has got one or two features that uh, I don't find easy in LibreOffice, like for example, because the way I use Calc is uh, well, the, the, basically what I don't uh, don't find easy is to make alternate rows uh, different color. It's easy in uh, it's easy in uh, OnlyOffice as it is easy in Excel, and uh, some other kind of icon dec- uh, functionality it, it might be better in uh, OnlyOffice, but it lacks. Uh, it's it's a light office suit. It doesn't have all the features of something like uh, LibreOffice or Excel. So uh, yeah, but definitely, as you said, more power, more choice, more power. It's good. Um, and from looking through the screenshots, it seems to be that just from muscle memory, um, anyone who's coming over from Microsoft Office with their ribbon UI might find it more at home with only office versus uh LibreOffice. Um just the way it's 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 set out by default, especially since the, the whole um colour bar and at the top as well. Um, um I use obviously I use Microsoft Office on my uh, work computer when I'm in work and that whole colour bar at the top like blue for your your word processor and uh, that kind of thing and their whole synergy and integration and all those marketing buzzwords um, if you're used to all that uh, op, uh, uh, only office might be something that would look more similar to you if that is what you're used to well LibreOffice uh, now offers a uh... LibreOffice now offers uh, the, the ribbon interface as well, but uh, I would also say that uh, for people who are serious about using spreadsheets, uh, visit data is the way to go. Uh, because, uh, yeah, as I was uh, saying last time, it's a proper program in the command line with a ton for 
of functionality. So, uh, yeah, uh, only Office, great for Kindle and presentation, and for people who want to uh, have a free of and open source Office suite, but like the way uh, like Microsoft Office is laid out and how it functions. Uh, but it doesn't have as many features as uh, as LibreOffice does, or indeed Microsoft Office. And uh, I think it's uh, it's not uh, the old. There are other there are other Office suites as well, and I keep trying them every now and then to see if there's any feature that I would like to about them. But I basically go back to using uh, LibreOffice uh, every time just because uh, I think it's the best option out there uh, for an office. It's it's certainly the, it, in the free and open source office suite world, it certainly has the most development eyes and the most development time dedicated towards it. Um, it's certain, uh, I say by far it's probably the most actively developed um so it would, it would most likely be the most stable the most reliable and also they're introducing new features all the time um so it will be a solid reliable uh office suite and also they're yeah they're adding on their extra features so they, it is is quite feature extensive as well so so two events that we would like to mention. Uh one of them has been kindly mentioned or brought to our attention in Twitter from Diogo uh, Constantino on Twitter. Ubicon is coming up on from the 10th to the 13th of October in Portugal. The link will be in the show notes. So for anyone who's connected with Ubuntu or would like to learn more about more about Ubuntu or anything Ubuntu or Canonical related, head over to Ubicon, which is in the 10th to the 13th of October in Portugal. And unfortunately, we will not be attending because we will be attending OGCAMP on, again, October, the 19th to the 20th of October in Manchester in the UK. Uh, OGCAMP is incredibly uh, fun. There's lots of really friendly community guys around there. Great for socializing and networking. And also you got to you get to attend the talks and there's some really, really interesting talks from, from when uh, we were there last year, uh, particularly highlighting the one of the, the guys who's effectively running a a mobile phone broadcast aerial off a series of Raspberry Pis and then went into presentation of the nitty gritty of if you want to roll out your own um mobile phone network of uh, obviously with the caveat of don't just do this there's 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 laws and regulations about you doing this but if you were going to do it this is how you do it and he gave a demonstration of a bunch of raspberry pies so that was incredibly incredibly interesting yeah and let's not forget that uh, Ocamp uh, gives you the opportunity to sample uh, a lot of alcohol at english prices which is um, <laughs> uh, you know that that i still i still have got fond memories of that uh, 2 pounds 50 for a pint <laughs> That was that was Sheffield. It's per, it, that is, was particularly uh, particularly inexpensive. I'm not expecting Manchester to be as inexpensive. Well, you know, there's better spoons everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not all not all with Witherspoons are equal, as we're finding out in Ireland, because Witherspoons are um, are over in Ireland, and they're not quite as cheap as that as that place in Sheffield. So. Just because it's a winter's booth does not mean that the price is going to be the exact same, no matter where you are. True that. So, moving on to our discussion part. Um, so, one thing that's been brought to our attention, again from Twitter, is running Linux on an old laptop um, from uh, Joey Fallon or Joseph Fallon, whoever he, however he chooses to to say his name uh, on Twitter 
I was looking at the specifications of it and thinking that's not particularly bad hardware. But then uh, that's that's me just showing my age. Going, Re- I remember when that stuff was new. Don't you <laughs> tell me that that's ba- that's that that's bad bad hardware. Um, I I I I remember a laptop with a with a, a Core Two Duo. So with a, a Core i Five, I was like, that's a decent processor, or a Core a Core i a Core i Three. Sorry. Yeah, second gen Core i3 with two gigabytes of RAM, and apparently it's not working very well. It's quite slow on uh, Lubuntu and Xubuntu as well, uh, with booting via live USB. Right, okay, so I think. Um, sorry to interrupt you there, Mike. I might, I might as well do him credence and actually read out the tweet so we, we everyone gets the exact context and in the way that he describes it. So he says. What is the minimum spec laptop you consider putting Linux on? Neighbor has a second gen i3 with 2 gigs of RAM. It crawls even with Lubuntu 64 bit or Zubuntu booting off a live USB. Worth adding a cheap SSD? Question mark. Well, um, first thoughts from, for me would be the, um, Zubuntu would be affected by the the fact that it's running off a live USB. Um, native hardware will always be faster than booting off a, a live uh, live image. But having said that, Zubuntu would tend to be heavier on resources than Lubuntu, and he's saying that even Lubuntu crawls. Uh, we were discussing this before uh, we started recording, and we say that definitely worth adding an uh, an ssd probably the best uh best bang for your buck in terms of in, uh, investment to the the difference that you will see it will have on your laptop is by far getting an ssd it's it's one of the best upgrades you can ever invest in um and i would say that with with the SSD, Lubuntu should should run fine. Yeah, I agree. I uh, I've uh, been I had been using a, a very old laptop, and I stuck uh, in it a very cheap 125 gigabyte Kingston, and uh, I, it it made it work smoothly. Like I I don't think uh, so. Basically, this uh, this laptop from from just the specs that we quoted. It looks like that even when it was new, it wasn't the best, uh, you know, it wasn't like top tier because it has only two gigabytes of RAM. I think even when a second gen i3s were new, uh, yeah. the like topper, higher higher value computers would come with like four gigabytes or even eight. Uh, that's why I'm thinking that the IO on it is not going to be the fastest. Uh, that means that the USB ports are not going to be great either. So that might affect the uh, live USB boot. And uh, definitely the hard drive that's in it is going to be, uh, it's not going to be like a premium uh, premium Toshiba or something. It's going to be something uh, something also lower tier. So I think even a cheap, a cheap SSD would, I mean, should, obviously, with the caveat that uh, I'm not responsible for anything I say, uh, <laughs> it should... It should be. It should improve it. At least that's my experience. That SSD, no uh, If you if you put an if you replace a hard drive with an SSD, is always an improvement. As for the distribution, uh, yeah, I would as as Connor uh, suggested, I would start with Lubuntu, and then if that still doesn't work, I would pros. Pro, I would uh, basically go down. Uh, obviously, and I would try to install it. Rather than using the rather than using live images because the USBs uh, on that computer might be very slow, the I/O on them or the through, uh, the bandwidth on the USBs might be very slow. So I would just basically try to install uh, from Lubuntu down uh, distribution. So uh, Connor before the call uh, meant or before the recording mentioned something like Panson Labs if Lubuntu doesn't work out. Uh, that's definitely a good idea because it's a lightweight distro with. Uh, did you say it was open box or flux box? Open box, isn't it? Um, Bunsen Labs is open box, um, and I've I've run open box or uh, open box. <laughs> I've run uh, Bunsen Labs in virtual machines over the years, um, s- s- like as recently as only a, uh, a 
a couple of couple of I think only about a month ago, um, or maybe even less less than that, um, when uh the new version with Debian Buster came out, and it runs on in about two hundred or three hundred megs of RAM, um. Well, no, as in that's its resources. I'm not saying that 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 would be all you would need to run it, but that is the resources that it uses when it's idling. So I'd say if you've even if you've uh, a computer with only one gigabyte of RAM, um, Bunsen Labs should be able to run um, quite happily. The only caveat with that would be is with some of their more modern programs um i don't know if they would start using up your ram quite quickly i uh, if you're running uh if you're have that old old of a computer with only 1 gigabyte of ram i pr- would definitely not recommend that you install chrome um <laughs> even firefox might might be a, scre- a stretch um i think it's 2 gigabytes of ram I know. I understand that. I was, I was just imagining, imagining a scenario of, of if you were only constrained to one gigabyte of RAM, um, with two with two gigabytes of RAM, and as you're saying, it is likely that that has was not maxed out when it was purchased. I would imagine, but uh, 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 Joey Fallon, I would suggest that you confirm this with your neighbor or even if you can access the hardware yourself to compare, confirm it yourself is to look up the the uh make a model of that laptop and look up the specifications online um, with a, a manual a user manual or something um that's provided for the manufacturer and that manual will likely tell you the maximum amount of ram that that uh motherboard can take and it's usually, as a good rule, it's usually twice what the original laptop came with. Uh, these these usually vary, uh, especially... It, this is true, especially if it's a multiple of two. Some laptops come, came out and they're, um, they came out with 6 gigabytes of RAM. I'm not suggesting that that is then capable of running 12 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's, it's usually a multiple of two, so if it came with two... The maximum that that motherboard can handle is usually four. If it came with four, it's usually eight. If it came with eight, it's usually uh, 16 and so on and so forth. Um, but I will definitely look into that. Um, uh, the two hardware recommendation, hardware upgrades I would recommend would certainly be first, getting the SSD. Second, if you can research it and if you can find out the specific uh, generation of RAM that it uses and if it can still be purchased at a reasonable price. Sometimes older RAM go up in price because of its scarce, scarcity um, would be to then double the RAM. So you then have a, a Core i3 with 4 gigs of RAM and a 120 gig or 256 gig or 500 gig or whatever you can afford hard uh, SSD inside the laptop and with those specifications, I would imagine that uh, Lubuntu would sh- for sure should be able to run on it, no problem at all. I was hazard to guess that Zubuntu with XFC should be fine, or Ubuntu Mate running the Mate desktop as well. Uh, you may even be able to run regular uh, Ubuntu with GNOME uh, uh, on it, or uh, uh, Kubuntu with KDE. Um, but your mileage will vary. But I would certainly uh, do those hardware upgrades, then look into Lubuntu and Zubuntu and Ubuntu Mate, and who knows? Even even if even if your the hardware is more than capable of running those distributions, you might settle on it and go. You know, I actually like Lubuntu. I actually like Zubuntu. I actually like Ubuntu Mate, and you do not feel that you need to upgrade to the quote-unquote more flashy desktops that use uh, greater hardware resources. Well, or, or you might go the other way and realize that there is a correct way of doing things and that's install um, Arch or Manjaro with i3 on that thing. It would fly, probably. 
Uh, yeah, and, uh, your, I thought your, you would definitely fly. And your neighbour might even thank you after he learns uh, how to how to use it if if he doesn't know now because there. It, uh, but uh, like in in complete uh, in complete seriousness, that's what I did on the on the original Pine book, uh, and that uh, uh, that is really good. So Manjaro with i three is extremely fast it doesn't take almost any resources so y you would have all that uh, ram or most of that ram still left intact for browsing which is what really is the most uh, resource hungry activity uh, on for most users and uh, yeah i can i can recommend it and it's uh, at least for me it's worth le uh, the learning curve uh, the to use i3 because Eventually, eventually, it boils down to a uh, few, maybe five or ten keyboard shortcuts that, and even you can, or even you can uh, use your mouse as well, obviously, on i3. And then uh, once, once people learn that, it becomes a really good experience. Yeah, um, your your mileage may vary. I do, just because I was curious, I just brought up my um, sister monitor on my computer at the moment and I ranked it by memory to so that the highest res res resources are at the top and Firefox is only using about 275 or less than 300 megabytes of RAM uh, but granted I only have two tabs open so um, as you open up tabs obviously that would shoot up but um, yeah it's um, it's it's not the heavy behemoth that everyone is making it out to be. So um, I would say suggest that maybe use Firefox over uh, something that is Chromium based, like um, Chrome or Vivaldi or Opera or all all those or um, Brave, who are all uh, Chromium based. I would suggest that maybe Firefox will be a better. Use a um, better resource user of RAM than anything Chromium based, but uh, again, it'll be down to your individual tastes. And also, there are a few extensions that can help people uh, with Firefox uh, browsing the web more economically. Uh, one of them is uh, like uh, I think it's called uh, Node.js. It's uh, it disables JavaScript and allows the user to allow it per site which obviously may affect rendering and some sites might not work, but at least if uh, one strays onto something like The Verge, where, uh, which is loaded with uh, a ton of uh, scripts, uh, the browser doesn't freeze into standstill. And another one would be, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's basically a tab manager. It, it, it freezes tabs, uh, it, uh, it kind of or suspends tabs that are not used. So once uh, once a user switches back to the tab, it has to reload, but they don't take up as many resources if they are not used. So if you, if people have got multiple tabs open, that's also a very good extension. And there are some, I think there is either Mozilla or some other website or maybe more websites that, uh, that uh, can help people uh, use Firefox uh, with less resources. And... Uh, I've once done this optimization on the on the Pinebook, and since then, Firefox became much more uh, leaner and easier to use as well. Yeah, some some very good tips there. So I think we will start to wrap things up. So, as always, if you want to get in touch with us, we are uh, we are on Telegram, which is telegram. dot com forward slash Linux lads. Uh, we're on Twitter, at Linux Lads. We're on Facebook. Um, just search for Linux Lads. <laughs> Mastodon, uh, again, it's Linux Lads. Or, at, at Linux Lads, at uh, hostux.social, but it's going to be in the show notes. Or email us at show at linuxlads.com. And also, if you want to throw us a, a fiver or a tenner for a, a, a coffee or just helping with our, our ongoing costs like hosting or anything like that is linuxlads.com slash support and it's all very much appreciated so for this episode I have been Connor and I've been Mike bye bye <laughs>